Good afternoon and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio online lunchtime talk. These are live every Friday at 1pm, beaming out live onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads and living room televisions. My name's Luke and I'm the Pervasive Media Studio. Good afternoon Media and Studio welcome producer. to the Pervasive Media Studio online lunchtime um, talk. These are live every Friday at 1pm, beaming out just forgot to mute myself on the YouTube channel that I was watching there. Anyway, the talks uh, here are our chance to throw open the digital doors of the Pervasive Media Studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. And especially a big welcome to any of you out there who are new to the studio, for whom this may be the first time you'll be engaging with what you do. Um, welcome, and here's a little bit more about what it is we actually do. The studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology with everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, University of West England and University of Bristol, and we're a home for early stage ideas and companies and a meeting place of both creative and commercial industries. We are a studio space and we offer desk space, meeting rooms, events, opportunities and networks all for free to our residents. Ultimately, we are a safe place for artists, companies and creators to take risks at early stages in their practice and make time for collaboration. Today, in today's talk, studio resident and theatre director Tanuja Amarasuria discusses her approach of making theatre by not doing it properly and the idea that how we tell stories is as important as the stories that we tell. There's a Q&A at the end uh, with the talk running at roughly 30 to 35 minutes. If you want to ask any questions, just pop them into the chat window and feel free to say hello as we go. Um, I'll pick them out and ask uh, Tanuja at the end. Um, there's a further reading list in the text beneath this video, so if you want to catch on to anything that Tanuja mentions in the talk, that's already there that you can reference. Um, do feel free to post any kind of feedback or questions, as I said, as we go. And if you want to tweet us rather than post them there, you can tweet us at PM Studio UK and I'll pick those up as well. A captioned and recorded version of the talk will be available here after this talk is finished. Next week's talk is called Far From Paradise, Radically Reimagining Social VR. Resident uh, Tessa Ratushinska examines the exclusionary repercussions of designing virtual reality for a uniform ideal user and explores the potential of social VR to generate new visions of public life, community and connectedness. You can get news on all our future talks by following us on at PM Studio on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram or subscribing to our newsletter on the website. Don't forget, while you're watching me talk, hit subscribe on the YouTube channel here and give the video a thumbs up. Uh, the more subscribers we get and the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Please do share the link because uh, we're live now and you can share it on any of your socials. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Tanuja. Uh, hi, thanks, Luke. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. So my name's Tanuja Amrasuria. I'm a theatre director. Um, and what that means in my case is that I've also found myself employed and paid to be a sound designer, a filmmaker, a dramaturg, and uh, just recently I've been asked to collaborate on two new video games. In fact, I probably get more paid work in these other areas than I do as a theatre director. But all of that adjacent work has started from people seeing my work as a theatre director. So why am I telling you this? Okay, well, I am not trained as a theatre director. I didn't have any concept of what a theatre director was until I left home and came to university. And quite often, um, my directing has been criticised, or at least questioned, by other theatre professionals on terms of theatre craft. And they were right in that I don't know how to do things properly. My starting points for how to do this are all over the place. But at the same time, I was getting responses from audiences, which were more along the lines of, I'm not really into theatre, but I really got into your show. Or, well, oh, I didn't know theatre could do that. And these responses weren't from using what we might now call immersive theatre tactics. These responses were all for shows where you go to somewhere like Bristol or Vic and you sit in a seating rake and you watch a show. But there was clearly something in me taking a more instinctive approach to how I thought these stories could become alive for an audience that was connecting with people in surprising ways. So none of this is rocket science, right? Um, if you're going to do things differently, you're going to get different results, which might connect with different people. 
But a lot of the time, when we talk about reaching new people, it's done with a kind of um, boringly instrumental attitude, I would say, either around scale, so it's about reaching more people, or with a clumsy notion of diversity, diversity, uh, whatever that word means to you. But what I want to dig into is what happens if we talk about difference in artistic rather than statistic terms? What if we got better at valuing and encouraging difference in relation to craft and aesthetics? Because I think that's essential to getting real change in terms of power, social and cultural narratives, who gets to make a living out of art, and there generally being more fun and fascinating stuff in the world for more people to access. Okay, so for um, some context, here's a little bit about me and my work. I was born in Sri Lanka. I grew up in County Durham. I came to Bristol to study and I've lived here ever since. I started a collaboration with a writer and composer called Tim X Atak in 2001. And we're still trying to finish the short film we started shooting in that year. Um, and then in 2010, Tim and I set up a company called Sleep Dogs, kind of um, as a way to protect some headspace to develop our more shape-shifty ideas alongside the various projects we work on with other artists and companies. We've made short films. This is All My Dreams on VHS, which we made in 2008, supported by the BBC Bristol Film Club. It's a rom-com about a guy who records his dreams via Dream Spoon technology onto VHS. Um, and it follows what happens when he brings a date home one evening. It's a comedy. And it didn't win any jury prizes at festivals, but it did win prizes and commendations when audiences voted. We've made theatre shows. This is Darkland Lighthouse, which we made in 2016 for Bristol Old Vic. It's a full on science fiction story about a lighthouse in deep space where a keeper and a quasi sentient computer spend their days warding interplanetary shipping away from a mysterious entity known as the Dark Land an entity which seems to consume anything that goes near it. And then, of course, as with all good lighthouse stories, the light goes out. Music and sound have always been very important elements in our work. So for example, in Darkland Lighthouse, um, there's this massive cinematic score that runs all the way through the show. Or in this show, The Bullet and the Bass Trombone from 2012, which is the story of an orchestra who get caught up in a violent military coup the story is told through a mix of news reports, interviews, field recordings, and musical construction and deconstruction, which is all played and mixed live in each performance. So the characters in the city are evoked through this intricate sound design. Or in this sight responsive headphone piece called Ocean Confessions, which we prototyped in 2018 in Hikodua in Sri Lanka where a sort of exploded moment magical realist voiceover and an orchestral score are played alongside the sound of the waves, which are mixed live into the piece. And all of course set in the vast cinematic landscape of the shoreline at night. So as you can see, I'm not exactly a purist when it comes to art forms, but I am spending a lot of time thinking about theater at the moment, in part because I miss bringing stories to life in a room with other people, in part because I'm a fellow on the Bristol and Bath Creative Cluster Expanded Performance Programme. So I'm part of a group of people researching the potential of live performance in conjunction with creative technologies. But also because, of course, COVID-19 restrictions have like completely polaxed the theatre industry. So it's an important moment, at least for those of us who've got the headspace to do this, to think about changing the industry. And the theatre industry really needs to change uh, because as has been exposed in many industries through movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter, the theatre industry is rife with violent biases, exploitative working practices, entrenched London centricity, static hierarchies, there's been talk recently about audience agency findings that the average age of theatre ticket buyers is 52 and set to get older because younger people want less traditional experiences. 
but they don't have the spending power of older people. So it's the older people that the theatres chase. But if you're a theatre or an artist that's more interested in people than in money, then what those findings say to me is that we really need more focus on creating different, less traditional experiences that welcome younger, more diverse audiences. Which is exciting because the amazing thing about theatre, the reason why I keep coming back to it, the amazing thing about theatre is that it is so super adaptable as a form. Theatre is essentially time in a space with people and you can fill it with anything. So um, maybe we could do less filling theatre with this and more filling it with this. Maybe less of this and more of this. And maybe less of this and maybe more of this. Okay, let's talk about taste. Take a moment and think about what experiences have really stopped you in your tracks. What sort of things have made you wanna leap around? What moves you to tears? What forces you to stop and think? What super thrills you or fills you with joy? It's important to talk about taste because once we're confident with our own taste, what we're influenced by, what turns us off, what turns us on, how our tastes change, where it's different from other people's taste. Once we're confident with our own taste, that's when we can really start taking authorship of our own stories and invite people to engage with our work on its own terms. So when we were making Darkland Lighthouse, I wrote a series of blogs about the genre and aesthetic influences on the show. I knew I was making some unconventional choices in terms of theatre making, so perhaps defensively, I wanted to let people know that um, this was a show that was more influenced by Alien and Solaris than by Shakespeare or Les Mis. Um, and it's interesting, one of the articles talks specifically about theatre influences on the show, but when I look back on it for this talk, I realised that three out of the five examples I give would definitely more be considered digital installations than theatre but they were really alive for me as environments. They reached into me and they made me feel stuff. And that's very much how I think about theatre directing. So that's the honest truth of what theatre is for me. It's important to talk about taste because when something looks or sounds or feels mind blowing in some way, it's more likely to have an impact on you and make you feel involved with something bigger than yourself. Now, there's a lot of fear amongst commissioners and funders and programmers about talking openly about taste. Uh, I think people worry that if they talk about taste, they're gonna be considered biased, which is crazy because of course they're biased. We're all biased. It doesn't mean that we can't see beyond those subjectivities, but if we don't talk about them out loud, then we can't be challenged on them and that's where the real danger lies. That's what perpetuates the defaults, the unspoken rules and the tacit oppressive hierarchies of judgment that you get in objective criticism. That's what perpetuates the perception that non-traditional theater is a niche interest because maybe it is a niche interest for an audience that's likely, largely white and retired. But what about all the other people who aren't already part of your audience? So our sci-fi show, Darkland Lighthouse, really split audiences, um, really. There'd be, there'd like always be arguments in the bar after the show um, between people who loved it and who hated it. So we might get a review like this. It's theatre at its most demanding, it's most uncomfortable, it's most evocative, it's most primal, it's most human, it's most complex and it's most brilliant. Um, and then a review like this. Darkland Lighthouse is a gravity-free tumble of mixed messages, false starts and confusion. Mm. But then we'd also get audience responses like this. 
absolutely loved Darkland Lighthouse. Creepy, atmospheric, thrilling, and beautifully performed. Saw it twice, mind blown both times. Such a treat to see sci-fi done so well on stage. Um, and like this, I must confess to not being a huge theatre goer, but I don't think I've ever seen, I've ever been so immersed in anything, performance or installation, as I was last night. It was like swimming in it. People are different and we connect in surprising ways to different things. Be honest about how you want your art to feel and move towards that truth. Craft is what allows people to be successful when they're not inspired. Um, I really love this quote, but okay, I am not against craft. I'm a big believer in craft actually. I'm a big believer in precision. Uh, I'm a big believer in skill, thoughtful decision-making, a big believer in practice. I love it when people say my work is well-crafted, which is probably why I feel the gut punch so hard when people say that it isn't. But uh, it's even worse when people say that it's not inspired. So I directed a play last year for Theatre 503 in London. Um, and in amongst pretty much exclusively strong reviews, which never happens for me, there was a pretty dour review from the Evening Standard, which included the line, Tanuja Amurasuri's staging is pedestrian. But then I was like, you know what? I kind of agree. I mean, there were lots of practical limitations on that production, which meant that I had to make some very pragmatic decisions. And one of the things I decided early on was to set aside the more visual and live art instincts that I often use. There were artistic and conceptual reasons for that decision, as well as practical ones. But if I'm honest, I kind of gave into making what I've heard the theatre designer Chloe Lamford call a four star pleaser. Now, I'm really proud of this show. I loved the play. I was working with a brilliant creative team and cast. The production really moved people and I wouldn't change any of my choices, but I definitely took a craft led rather than an inspiration led approach to directing this play. So Theatre 503 is a tiny theatre above a pub. It's got very limited tech. During previews, whilst we were fine tuning stuff, I was moaning about um, how it was a shame that we couldn't rig side lighting. And Lisa Sperling, who's the wonderful, wonderful artistic director of Theatre 503, said, but side lighting just makes everything look like a dance show. And I was like, oh, but I love that. In fact, we've occasionally turned up to theatres with a sleep dogs show and the tech team have gone, oh, we thought you were a dance company because of the lighting plan. Now, that's my taste. I generally prefer the more cinematic and sculptural way that dance shows are lit to the conventions of theatre lighting. I'm sometimes more interested in shadows, silhouettes, the architecture of the space than I am in seeing the face that's speaking. Maybe it's because I'm not properly theatre trained. Maybe it's because so much of my training has basically come through listening to DVD commentaries and interviews with film directors because it's pretty rare to find info about how different theatre directors work. There's loads of interviews and podcasts with playwrights, barely anything about other roles in theatre. So if, like me, you're someone who hasn't had the privilege of formal drama school training, you're going to be learning a technique in other ways, learning from who and what you're inspired by, even if that means making theatre shows that are lit for bodies rather than faces. And maybe you'll find some revelation if you just sit with something that feels strangely lit or where the actors have their backs to, backs to you the whole time or where a performer is simply slamming their body to the ground over and over again. There are so many different ways that we take in information and make meaning. We don't just make meaning from specifics like narrative, character, location. We also make meaning from things like rhythm, proximity, absence, repetition, comedy, duration, atmosphere. And I think it's often through these more abstract, less literal tactics that the more surprising, complex, profound 
and lasting emotional resonances take hold. How we tell our stories is as important as, as what stories we tell. So one of the reasons why there are so many more interviews, podcasts, articles about writers' processes than um, there are about other theatre creatives is because UK theatre still thinks that that's really where authorship lies. I mean, if you're lucky as a playwright, your play gets published and it can be distributed and studied in a way that live productions can't. But it doesn't take a PhD to get that there's a difference between this production of Macbeth and this one and this one. And I've seen all these versions. They all feel very different, but the story is super clear every time. Insane Roots production in Redcliffe Caves, Forced Entertainment's Tabletop Shakespeare and Akira Kurosawa's Throne of Blood are as much expressions of those artists as they are of Shakespeare's play. How we tell our stories, the processes by which we share them, that is part of the authorship of the work. And that's where directors, producers, designers, everyone involved in the collaboration has a part to play in that authoring. And personally, I'd include the audience in that, even if there's no visible interaction, is attention, emotional immersion, interpretation. These are all really active forms of engagement, even if they're invisible. So as a director, my main channel of authorship is in designing and leading the process by which we bring the story alive in whatever space we're gonna be sharing it with an audience. And my choices, in that don't come from a textbook. They are my personal ex expression. They're informed by my instincts as an artist, by my taste, and by my experience of living in this world with other people. And my experience of this world has always been highly mediated. For me, even the togetherness of family has often been at a, at a distance via aerogram letters and then long distance phone calls with huge sound delay then via email and now via WhatsApp and Zoom. So digital technology is not a novelty gimmick to me. It's not an add-on to proper theatre. For me, technology is so much about connection and people, about how we are present in the world. Technology exists alongside blood and nerves and bodies for me, not in opposition to them. I mean, you only need to feel the kind of glorious physical woof of sub base or the tension and frustration of a bad internet connection, to be honest, to get what I mean. Yet, integrating di digital tech with theatre making is so hard to make happen well, not least because of the rigidity of conventional theatre processes. Most theatres still work to the assumption that a production will require three to four weeks rehearsal, actors only, in a random room plus a few days of tech and previews, if you're lucky, before opening with a press night. Now, this production line model makes it really hard to incorporate difference, whether that's by integrating new technologies or having more open casting processes or doing audience development that goes beyond your established strategies. And the thing is, if you use a sausage machine, you're gonna get sausages. I mean, you might make better and better sausages, but I don't go to the theatre for sausages. So, you know, get some different machines or maybe just break the machines. I think what I'm asking is if we remember that the art people make is a living, breathing, active expression and connection, something that people from writer to audience member bring themselves to and invest themselves in, rather than treating art as a machine built product to facilitate ticket income, then maybe we'll discover it speaks to more people in different ways about different things. So back in 2017, I wrote an article called Wrong Kind of Asian, Wrong Kind of Work in which I said, it's hard to express how pervasive the idea of what it means to be an authentic artist of color is and how destabilizing and isolating it can feel to be an artist of color who does not fit that mold. I can't tell you how many times I've thought about whether I should use more explicit autobiography in my work 
or whether I should look for issue-led plays to direct, even though that's not where my artistic inquiry naturally leads me. So that was three years ago, but I still feel that tension. And if anything, I feel like this pigeonholing has got worse. I'm worried that, albeit well-meaning diversity initiatives like arts councils, creative case for diversity, which focus on scale and visibility of tick box diversity can, albeit unintentionally, entrench this kind of exoticization. It puts focus only on personal identity, not at all on artistic identity. And if all the black people you employ are only working on stories about the slave trade, or all the South Asian people you employ are telling stories about arranged marriages, then what is your organization really saying about the world and how it is or how it could be? I get that it's important to understand access and representation on demographic terms, but if we want a diverse art sector, we have to acknowledge, invite, encourage, and be fans of diverse artistic identities too. So one of the reasons I'm interested in using technology as an artist is that conventions around how we use those technologies aren't so entrenched. I'm not boxed in so hard to the stories that I'm expected to tell. If I'm honest, uh, it's also probably a kind of fierce raging reaction that I've had all my life, to be honest, to the twin assumptions that women aren't interested in tech things and brown art is basically just folk dance and sitars. And, you know, Return of the Jedi was the first film I saw at the cinema and I always wanted a lightsaber. And one of the things I really enjoy about digital tech is that it rewards play rather than training. Things change so fast that there's really no time to set down too many rules. I love that it's an iPad instrument like Borderlands, which brought me back to music making after 20 years, because it looks so different to a piano or a flute. that I didn't have to worry about remembering my technique. There was no obvious way to play this instrument properly. So I just played. And the music I make with Borderlands would be impossible for me to even dream of making on a piano or a flute. In my first few weeks of music GCSE, my teacher marked down one of my compositions for its reliance on what music theory calls perfect fourths and fifths. But it sounds good, I insisted. Yes, it does sound good, said my teacher, but it's not good composition. So I quit music GCSE. I, I just couldn't buy into the notion that the theory of music was more important than the experience of music. And now that was 30 years ago. So I hope music GCSE has changed since then. But that insistence on the establishment terms of what makes good theatre is still very present and regularly inscribed by gatekeepers and critics. For an art form that trades on the magic of liveness, this industry has such a deep, deep fear of unpredictability. I remember hearing from Improbable, who are one of the UK's most long established independent theatre companies, how they'd been told that they'd never be trusted to run a building because their processes were too unpredictable. And this is a company whose operas are some of the most successful that the ENO has ever produced. A few years back, I was talking to another theatre director about craft, about theatre craft. And at one point, they dismissed the entirety of that live art stuff as not paying attention to craft or audiences. And now, I knew I was talking to someone who had no taste for performance art, but I was still pretty shocked by such a brazenly ill-informed generalisation from someone in a position of power. A classic case of personal taste and opinion being stated as factual criticism. I worked as a live art producer for many years. I've talked to those artists, I've seen their work, I've observed their processes. And some of the most precisely tuned and entertaining theatre I've ever seen has come out of live art. It might just be taking a different attitude to what's important. Theatre doesn't have to be about character psychology, in the same way as music doesn't have to be about time signatures, and technology doesn't have to be about screens. But it's those snobberies, those ill-informed category errors, those unchecked assumptions 
the dismissing of differences niche interests so it can be marginalized into culturally themed programs or experimental festival programs it's that which means that all we see on so many stages are shows which come out of the sausage machine and that's what i want to break now some of this fear of unpredictability is hidden under the guise of managing risk. The work of theatres has become about sustaining businesses. And fair enough if you're a commercial theatre, but should public funding also serve the same commercial understanding of value for money? Should it really be about the put one pound into a theatre building and get three pound back into the economy? Is that what success is for the theatre industry? Should we be making theatre for ticket buyers, average age 52, mostly white and highly educated, or for lots of different people? Because it's theatre. You can fill it with anything. Make different rules, break different rules, break your own story. Oh, don't judge me. Um, you can make your own choices, but I'll leave you with that. Anyway, so um, here's something that Tim, who I work with in Sleep Dog, says. For a story to be truly universal, you can't tell it through a position of default. It's a belief that underpins how he writes. It's an attitude that deeply informs how we work together. For us, it's not about trying to serve everyone all the time. But it's about recognizing that every choice that we make about how we tell stories is going to exclude some people sometimes. We all have those choices to make. I mean, I'm never going to forgive Disney for opening up all of that possibility with John Boyega's character Finn in The Force Awakens and suggesting that anyone could be a Jedi at the end of The Last Jedi and then letting the rise of Skywalker revert to a story of power running through bloodlines and all the non-white characters either left behind or like finding happiness in their own tribes or whatever. I mean, I know you've got nine mythic films to tie up, but seriously, was it that important to be neat? What does it mean to do things properly? Especially if doing things properly requires defaulting to conventions that don't mean anything to you or deny your truth in some way. Who are you trying to impress here? What are you expressing? So there's a script writing convention known as breaking the story. It essentially means figuring it out understanding what the story is from the inside out and how to wrangle it. I think most of my life I've been trying to find ways to break my own story, work out who I am in the world, so I can contribute to the world with my own agency and hopefully help other people feel like they can also contribute uh, and participate in the world on their own terms. The work I'm now doing with computer games or with sound design all comes from the way that I personally approach directing theatre. I've been considered for those jobs because of the distinctive ways that I've built worlds or built atmosphere. I got those gigs because of the unusual choices I made, because of the things I did differently. So I'm just going to end with a couple of quotes, uh, firstly from an interview with the games designer and Anthropy. There's a huge debate going on with academic games programmes, which is still very new, about whether soft skills or hard skills are more important to teach. Hard skills are developed in learning the tools, like how you use Unity or Unreal. The soft skills deal with learning how you design an experience, how you frame it in a certain way, how you think critically about the art you're making, all the stuff that makes you a better artist. But it's hard to quantify. The university administration is very outcome oriented. They want measurable metrics. That to me is not what the program is about. A program that focuses only on hard skills is not a good program because those tools will all be replaced when they're outdated. You can learn how to use tools from the internet. I've done that. I used to be an Adobe Flash game developer. What's more important and what will carry over from tool to tool is to know how to think critically, develop a design sensibility and cultivate your own aesthetic. It's much more useful to you in the long run. And finally, from Ursula Le Guin, 
All of us have to learn how to invent our lives, make them up, imagine them. We need to be taught these skills. We need guides to show us how. Without them, our lives get made up for us by other people. Thanks for listening. Tanuja, I mean, I don't really know where to begin. That was amazing. Thank you. I feel like we should probably just have a moment of silence to let take everything in. <laughs> but that always looks weird on video calls when there's not there's no audio. Um, there are some questions kicking off. So if anyone is watching and wants to ask a question of Tanuja, please drop them in the chat or tweet us at PM Studio UK. We've got about 20 minutes for the Q&A, so we'll pack as many of them in as we can. Um, bit of applause kicking off in the chat there for you as well, Tanuja, and lots of really lovely feedback as we went. Um, Claire Doherty is the first person to kick us off a question. She says, where are the glimpses of change you want to see in enabling more progressive, more groundbreaking, groundbreaking work, and who's getting it right? <laughs> oh, my God. Cool. Well, I mean, I think, I think it's all there. It's all happening in the sense that um, I always think about the Rebecca Solnit book, Hope in the Dark, and that kind of notion that really all of this stuff is happening at the margins. This isn't, this isn't, um, this isn't kind of new and sudden thinking. Um, so I think all those examples are happening in different ways at the edges of all these different industries. Um, and I think there's something interesting about, like, in terms of the theatre industry, there is there is a lot of kind of entrenching going on in terms of, you know, like, let's just get some, let's get Ray Fiennes to do a monologue about David Hare's experience of coronavirus. But there's also an absolute need for theatres to rethink their business models. And you are getting theatres sort of saying that explicitly because it's just become vital. And then, um, and I think the kind of forcing of that, the sort of like the, like the massive disruption of that is, is going to make change and I think you know change makes there are positives and uh there are, well basically there are unpredictable outcomes that come from trying new things and doing things differently and there'll be positive and negative things um that come out of that who is getting it right I mean I always think at that and I would say this but I do always think kind of look to the edges look to the uh look to the artists look to the independents um partly because I think it, you know, in some ways it is, it's easier to take some of those risks and do that invention. Um, and uh, that's perhaps the job of kind of like some of the institutions to really kind of look in those directions and rather than kind of co-opting, maybe actually sort of sup like learn about those processes as well about, as well as about the product and then um, bring those into establishment thinking. Right. Uh, Duncan Speakman asks, "Are you? A, do you have a secret flute playing history that we don't know about?" <laughs> I do. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> I can't believe you didn't know this, Duncan. But I am. I'm like a. Yeah, I'm like a grade seven flautist, but I haven't played the flute since I left home, and um, uh, I was very lucky because I when I was because I'm so old, uh, I didn't have to pay for music lessons at first. I got to do like a little test at my school and they could see like a little bit of talent or whatever. So I got to have some, I could pick one of three instruments um, and I picked the flute and then I couldn't make a sound out of it for the first lesson and I was in tears and everything like that. But then anyway, it's uh, yeah, I thought I was doing really well with the flute and it just sort of dropped off, but yeah. Uh, Duncan's just said, okay, booking you for some sessions soon. I think maybe like we'll just scrap next week's lunchtime talk and have a live one hour recital. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> I, did, this is, I guess, uh, you know, I, I picked it up again uh, every now and then, and I've completely forgotten how to read music, but I have got like a body memory. So I can look at a piece of like, you know, like a Bach study or something, and my, my fingers will remember how to play it, even though I can't, there's no like, sort of conscious act of translation there. So I don't know what that says about kind of like embodied learning, but anyway. So on top of the deep insights into creative practice and breaking all the rules, we've just learned something that a lot of us did not know about Tanisha. <laughs> um, another question from the chat. Is there a particular moment, staging, scene, etc., that you feel was partic particularly mold breaking or that represents this issue and kind of backlash well? 
the so what's going to be like like radical to me is going to be it's it's going to be like a sort of uh, a mainstream to someone else and I, I kind of think um there are loads of moments for me where I've gone oh my god that was amazing and and it's it I think it's uh oh I could oh I could list loads of things but I I mean one of the things I always think about is that you know so I didn't I never studied uh, theatre before I came to university. It wasn't available in my school. I uh, would occasionally get to see RSC productions at what was Newcastle Playhouse at the time, because the RSC would tour up there. Um, but it was always within an English literature context. I just literally saw Shakespeare um, and some classics. And then I came to university and I came and studied theatre and film because, again, at the time, I didn't have to pay university fees. My careers teacher told me to follow my curiosity. She said, after university, you're going to have to get a job and you have responsibilities. This is the last time you get to follow your curiosity. So that's what I did. And it changed my life. Um, and, um, and in the first like two months, in the October, I think it was, October or November of my first term, I saw Forced Entertainment Speak Bitterness. And I'd never seen anything like that. I'd never seen any direct address, really, you know, that wasn't like, you know, an aside. Um, so, and it completely blew my mind. And I, you know, I've gotten, I had no academic education in theatre then. This wasn't like I needed to, I, I, was, I was kind of understanding something sort of cerebral or complex, which is one of the reasons why it does my head in when people say experimental theatre is um, somehow inaccessible. It's like, no, 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 not necessarily. Um, and it absolutely connected with me and it, it, it just blew my mind as to what what was possible in the space. So I guess that's one thing I can clearly point to. Um, do you, this is, a bit, I'm, I'm going to chuck in a question, like I'm just going to use my, my the fact that I host things. But do you think, uh, we've got a couple more questions in the chat, but please do keep them coming if, you are, if you're watching. Um, and again, reminder, you can tweet us at PM Studio UK if you're not in the chat and you want to ask Tanuja a question. We've got about 15 minutes left um, and plenty more to pack into that. Um, do you think that kind of live arts origins in the in like DIY culture are, like a part of the reason why institutions are kind of so mi often misunderstand it as a practice or fearful of it as a space? Yeah, I think so. And I think there's a kind of to and fro there, you know, because there's also, I, I used to um, work in the live art programming and producing team at Arnolfini uh, back when it was, you know, it had to like a really um, consistent and regular program. Uh, and I used to work with Helen Cole there who now runs in between time. And the the kind of push and pull of kind of like being there was there was something that felt like you know that part of the role of live art is as a kind of um, as an engine to test some of those boundaries as a space uh, to collect some of that. But there's also like there is an equal amount of kind of like um, snobbishness from the live art sector about what theatre is and what theatre can do and um, and I think the, I don't know whether it's institutions having a, a problem with that unpredictability per se, or whether it's the way that institutions are told or taught to behave um, and the amount of scrutiny that there is on institutions to kind of behave in a certain way and present in a certain way. That means that the pe people that tend to get the roles at the top of those institutions, even if they come from those backgrounds sometimes, um, are then kind of uh, surveyed by boards and are kind of subject to funding systems or whatever that just, that, that force a kind of, um, that make it difficult to make space for, for, for kind of like holding that possibility. I think it takes a real like strength of conviction and belief to, to back that. Um, and there's just a lot of fear. There's a lot of there's a lot of that. I and mean, one of the reasons why it was so great working with Theatre 503, even though they've got like about 25p, is that they they really back the work. And even though you can't do all the things that you you haven't got the money to do, or things you might want to do initially, you you can you can still push at the edges of what's possible because you're really really backed by that organisation. 
and um, they don't have a lot of arts council funding and they you know they've got you know a tiny space and they they've got a bit more like freedom I guess to to get on get on the ship with you I mean there's a lot in that taught to behave in terms of institutions is a really interesting phrase and might well be the title of the next talk you come and do for us I imagine <laughs> we'll see. um back to the chat um what would you recommend to young people who want to break into theatre what to study how to start oh it's a big question I think with anything like this it's it's like you got to find ways to fall in love with it and if you if if you're interested in it just keep well talk to people I think that's probably the that's probably the best thing to do. Don't feel like you need to wait for permission. Um, and also don't feel like you need to go through proper channels. Just like go see a show. One of the great things about theatre is so often you're in the room with people. So you can see who's like part of the company and you can go find them in the bar afterwards. Just chat because no one is going to get annoyed about someone coming up to them and saying, I'm interested in what you do. Talk to me. Um, and uh, just, and and I think yeah, pay attention. I, I think for me, one of the one of the one of the ways I really started taking confidence in my practice was I was I would go into I'd be in the audience of whatever in a gig um, at the cinema, watching telly, um, at the theatre, and I would, and I'd, I just kind of be conscious about what I was enjoying I was like oh I had a really great time there like why why did I feel like that was an amazing gig is it because the like the bass was just coming through me like you know really physically or and then okay I want my theatre show to feel like that so like like it's just put loads of bass in the in the seating rake or whatever so that thing of just opening yourself up to what it feels like knowing what you love like on the inside there and then kind of I mean, I'm a geek for process, so I, I do like I love watching DVD commentaries and like listening to, you know, kind of technical podcasts and stuff like that. And um, not everyone's into that kind of thing, but um, start with what inspires you, I think, is the thing. And don't let anyone don't let anyone say it's don't do it like that. Just just don't let them do that. Keep going. Find someone else. Find different allies. I mean, that was a pretty resounding answer there. Um, uh, Matthew Austin uh, asks, what role do you think the people training in inverted commas, uh, emerging artists have to play in change, e.g. higher education institutions, teaching performance of theatre, how could they be doing things differently? Yeah. You're getting some big questions here to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, I rule the world. Well, I mean, you know, I could, like, like I said in the, talk and also like that's coming through in the in my responses to the questions I think there's so much in um the fact that I had uh access to some of those bits of learning without having to worry about paying for them that was really um that gave me opportunities that meant that I didn't have to think about them in a kind of like uh, well you know in, in a commodified way so I wasn't looking for if I invest in this am I going to get a job in the end of it. it was like actually thinking in a slightly different way and so I think letting people um letting people um find their own way through things and I think also with art there's a there's there is a real like um push towards the sort of instrumentalism that I'm very resistant to because I kind of think that art is a more soulful place for for complex feelings rather than statements that's not really what I mean and so I think those things can be hard to to talk about quickly and hard to assess um and we're in a very like hugely assessment driven culture which is absolute anathema I think to that kind of um that kind of sort of uh, like sort of spiritual development like kind of the maturity of like being a person in the world and I think there is something, there's something in that, um, in terms of like, how do you, how do you make space for that in an assessment driven world and just let it be that people play. And in terms of kind of our, the sort of, um, kind of the beginnings of professional training, I hate the term emergent artist. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Um, that it's like, 
everyone, you know, if you're an artist, you, you're kind of developing, you, you're following your curiosity and you're developing your ideas all, all the time. And the idea of emerging, it sort of suggests, to be honest, a sausage machine to me and the idea that there's a linear progression. And I think there's a real, I see it in a lot of um, uh, artist development uh, schemes where there's this notion of a kind of a ladder of progression. Um, there's an idea that the institution or the venue or the producer should have the answers um, when actually it's perhaps more about kind of just like holding some space for for different kinds of exploration and, and actually like the producers going oh do you know what you I have no idea how to comment on this thing or you just like to you know and not not trying to kind of correct stuff so yeah I mean break down the hierarchies that's always what it is just people and give them time to grow you know like that's what we're all doing yeah there's a lot in there about expectation and hierarchy that's really interesting um joseph orton asks do you think the pandemic has or will accelerate theaters and funders and likelihood to try new ideas uh are companies putting on creative at home shows which display a desire for this content from audiences and it's kind of two questions so let's take the first one um mm. Do you think the pandemic will accelerate theatres and funders' likelihood to try new ideas and change? Um, well, I think it. I think it will for some people. I think it. I think there'll be some people that take it as uh, that will take it as a, an absolute um, uh, push to 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 kind of to to address some of the the sort of like, um, or to clear out some of the dead wood in their thinking, I guess. I think there'll be those people that do that, but it's also really evident that there are those who will use it as um, um, as an opportunity to kind of say, well, no, that does mean actually we just need to get famous people doing existing plays um, and uh, charge, you know, 50 quid a ticket for them. But the... And it's like, well, that's always going to happen. And like, you know, we're in a capitalist world and that's that's going to happen. Um, but I think particularly for the theatre industry, because it has been so completely um, devastated, really, by that. Um, and what I, I, there are, it, it's exciting to me to hear like Bristol or Vic say explicitly, we do need to look at our business model. That's not something, it's an unusual thing to hear, like um, an institution sort of admit that. And that feels really exciting because it's suddenly like, well, great, because we're all creative people and um, there are all these possibilities with theatre. So I think, um, I think it's going to be a bit of both. And I think it's up to, there's so much of it that's linked to that thing about kind of taught behavior. Um, that's like, we, we need to really like uh, understand our own terms of success rather than looking for validation and affirmation necessarily from other people that have their own terms of success. And so, you know, if, um, if, you're gonna, if your idea for what makes a show successful is whether it, um, that horrible phrase, washes its face in terms of its budget, then you're going to make different decisions to well if you're going to like I want to make sure that maybe 10 years down the line is going to like have a franchise that looks like this so I, I think it's the same problem but there's just because the circumstances have changed I think some people will will it'll it'll open up some opportunities for some people which is exciting great uh Chris Swain asks uh really liked your soft skills quote is there any advice you would give to people teaching technical theater skills or theater design that they could incorporate into how they teach these topics um, well i think it's all the same thing and also i'm like um the idea of being able to learn technical skills and design skills from someone like chris feels very exciting because like i you know he's a generous human being and and i think that thing of just kind of respecting people um, and it not being about a kind of top-down authoritarian uh, position, that it's not like a kind of stat, sort of like strict pedagogy. Um, and I think, you know, practitioners, if they're, if they're actually practicing and constantly discovering and sort of realizing all the stuff that, that they don't already know, 
all the time because they're constantly making you work. I think that's that's a brilliant way to um, to help people find their own kind of processes for discovery because I think that is what like being an artist is so much about. And I think also just talking about where things go wrong or where things go differently that is really that's really helpful that idea of like helping people understand that it's not necessarily a failure to you know not meet your arts council targets or whatever it's not really not, not necessarily a failure of you as an artist but it just means you didn't meet those targets something else happened um and what are the valuable things from that something else mm. Okay, we've got time for one more question, so I'm just going to squeeze it in on the end. Ali Robertson asks, uh, or says, I thought when I came to Bristol that it could be a great city at bringing the work you are talking about into the mainstream as a matter of course, and in many ways it is, and we can all quote organisations, festivals, happenings in Bristol that we love, but do you think it is that city now, and are there other UK cities getting it right? Hmm. Um, I don't think it is that city. But I probably would always think that because I think I'm probably always going to be like, yeah, and, and like push it, push further, push further. Um, but I also think that that I can't speak hugely for other cities. I mean, there are different there are different things like think about a city like Manchester, where they've got like massive production resources. But my memory always when I used to work in Manchester is that it was actually very um, as an artistic community, really. Uh, really disparate not particularly collaborative um and so for a long time they didn't really have that they didn't have the kind of critical thinking um to to make the magic ideas that were going into those sorts of spaces um and whereas in bristol we've got like no production resources and shrinking production resources but i know absolutely that one of the reasons why there are so many brilliant artists that choose to make this their home even though many of us can't really make theatre work in this city, often can't show it in this city, um, and are working like nationally and internationally instead, it's because the 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 kind of the critical conversation is just at such an interesting level. And that's partly because of the scale. It's not it's not massive, but there's enough critical mass to have um, a kind of healthy level of, I wouldn't say competition, but an understanding that it's that that in amongst limited resources, it it's it's useful to have a distinctive voice and so the kind of cultivation of your own ideas and it's something that um that uh that tim who I would says a lot that this is a good city because you can you can be friends with people whose work you don't like and i think that kind of um so that's the sort of kind of critical rigor and the ambition uh, and actually to be honest the outward focus that bristol a lot of bristol artists have because they can't make in this city means that there's um that there is a lot of great work happening just not necessarily here but then it is sort of happening here because that's where a lot of it's generated so it's you know it's always there's always room for more and the mainstream is always shifting so you know well, on that uh, note, I think we're going to have to bring it to a close. Uh, Tanisha, like, I want to say a big thank you. It's been a real pleasure to round out the week with so much to think about. And there are like so many quotes we can pull out of this to share it with other people in the future. Um, but thank you very much uh, for speaking today. Um, next week's talk, for those of you who are still watching, uh, is called Far From Paradise. It's, the, it's um, radically reimagining social VR. Uh, and studio resident Tas Tessa Ratushinska examines the exclusionary repercuss repercussions of designing virtual reality for a uniform ID user and, ex and, and explores the potential of social VR to generate new visions of public life, community and connectedness. You can get news on all our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram or subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Before you go, please do hit subscribe below and give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get and the more likes we get, the more stories we can share like this. A captioned and recorded version of the talk will be available shortly after we finish today. So share that link and tell your friends. Um, I want to thank you very much for joining us uh, on this Friday afternoon and we'll see you all same time, same place next week.